Good morning and very warm welcome to our Ministry Area online service. We are here in St. Mary's, the Virgin in Brima. It's a beautiful day. Let us worship together. Good morning. I'm Julian Stedman, one of the lay ministers in the St. Katok Ministry Area, and it's a pleasure to lead the service for the sixth Sunday of Easter from my home here in Crickhowl. Others will be joining us today in taking part in our service. In particular, I'd like to thank the Reverend Jeremy Bevan who will be preaching for us this morning. Rogation Sunday is the day when the church has traditionally offered prayer for God's blessings on the fruits of the earth and the labours of those who produce our food. We shall miss the opportunity this year to gather outside to pray together for all aspects of our natural environment and for our local communities. However, we can still do that from our homes. Let's pray. Lord God, creator of the world in which we live, we pray your blessing on our land, the crops we grow, our animals and livestock, and those who work for providing food for our daily needs. Bless each one during this time of national crisis. Amen. We now sing together a hymn of praise to God. Let's sing.
Bless our God, O peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard, who has kept our soul among the living and has not let our feet slip. For you, O God, have tested us. You have tried us as silver is tried. You brought us into the net. You laid a crushing burden on our backs. You let men ride over our heads. We went through fire and water, yet you brought us out to a place of abundance. I will come into your house with burnt offerings. I will perform my vows to you, that which my lips uttered and my mouth promised when I was in trouble. I will offer to you burnt offerings of fattened animals with the smoke of the sacrifice of rams. I will make an offering of bulls and goats, selah. Come and hear, all you who fear God, and I will tell what he has done for my soul. I cried to him with my mouth, and high praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But truly, God has listened. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, because he has not rejected my prayer or removed me from his steadfast love. As we come together this morning, we can't be together in body, but we can still use words to remind us of the greeting that we have for each other. So let's join together. Grace, mercy and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and also with you. We seek our Father's forgiveness for the things we have done wrong. Let's have a moment or two of silence as we reflect on our lives. And now let's say the words together. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore to us the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, pardon you, forgive you, and having mercy on you, set you free from sin, strengthen you in goodness, and keep you in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now we express our gratitude to God through praise and thanksgiving, using words that come from Psalm 95. Let everything be said and done in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God through Jesus Christ. Sing psalms, hymns and sacred songs. Let us sing to God with thankful hearts. Open our lips, Lord, and we shall praise your name. Come, let us sing to the Lord our God. Raise the roof to the rock of rescue. Come into the presence of the Lord with thanks. Raise the rafters with songs of praise. The Lord is the great God over all, greater than every other power. He holds the depths of the earth in his hands and the mountain peaks belong to him. The ocean is the Lord's. It was made by God. The land was formed by his own hands. Come, let us bow before the Lord, our Maker. With humble hearts we worship God. The Lord is God and we are his. We are the shepherd's very own flock. We come now to our scripture readings, following which Jeremy will read the gospel and preach our sermon for this morning. A reading from the book of Genesis. 
Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and took some of every clean animal, and some of every clean bird, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground and all fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. And for your lifeblood I will require a reckoning. From every beast I will require it, and from man. From his fellow man I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. And you, be fruitful and multiply, increase greatly on the earth and multiply in it. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you as many as came out of the ark. It is for every beast of the earth I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you, for all future generations. I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth, and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it, and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. A reading from Acts. Paul addresses the Areopagus. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he saved by human hands, as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we indeed are his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness 
by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Hear the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to Christ our Saviour. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to Christ our Saviour. It can be lovely when the sun shines and you feel the warmth of the sunshine, the warmth of spring and summer, the brightness of the sun. But the sunlight's not always that comfortable. My little weak European eyes feel the brightness and I have to squint up my face to shield them from the brightness of the glare. So it can be restful to go into the shade. In today's reading, we heard about Noah. Not the part of the story of Noah which people normally associate with the name. Not about the flood and the building of the great big boat and the animals going in two by two. We heard about what Noah did afterwards. After the flood had gone down, after the dry land had appeared, after the animals had left and scattered and gone wherever they were going. The name Noah means rest. His father said, let us, let, we will name him Noah in the hope of gaining rest from our labours and from our toil and from our wearisome time on the earth. His father Lamech was wearied and wanted rest. And so he named his son Noah, which means something like rest. And in the beginning of this reading, it starts off saying, Noah built an altar to the Lord. And he made a burnt offering, a kind of sacrifice, which was completely consumed by fire. And it said the Lord smelt what's called here the pleasing odour. In Hebrew, the word that for the pleasing odour is the reach nichroach. The word nichroach comes from the same verb stem as Noah, meaning rest. You might say that Noah, the man of rest, offered a restful smell on his altar, and the Lord was satisfied. The Lord then swore never again will I curse the ground because of man, no matter how evil he is. Never again will I wipe away everything for as long as the earth endures. It was a promise. The name in that passage is Lord, the name given to Moses. We're to understand that passage, that promise, that inner pledge from our Lord God as part of the covenant he made with Jesus as part of his understanding, his promise, his agreement with his people. The rest of that, that story about the rainbow and about the, um, the curse on, on whoever kills the blood of a man and about eating and all this kind of thing, all this is described as in the name of, the, of God, not the Lord. So this puts this, this, the rest of this passage into the, the kind of literature in the Bible known as wisdom literature. It's intended to show us how the world is. This is what it's like, irrespective of our relationship to God. Somehow it's in the nature of things that animals will be afraid of us, that we will eat meat, 
and that if a man sheds the blood of a man, then his blood should be shed. Somehow these things are bound up in the very nature of things, and that somehow to contradict them is to contradict the way things are. It's an explanation, if you like. The flood story is a story of judgment, the Lord's anger on the evil in people on the earth. The flood wipes out the evil, and Noah, who is described as spotless, as blameless, builds the ark and saves his family and saves the people, the, the animals, sorry. He therefore rides out the storm, the ark comes to rest, and Noah lets the animals out, and this is where we are. He is filling up a new world. A new world has been made. Judgment has passed. And now things are being restored and made new again. With a pledge. With a promise. It implies that this will come to an end. It says, for as long as the world endures. In other words, it says in the rest of scripture that the world will be rolled up like a scroll, like an old piece of clothing. But until that time, this is how it's going to be. That idea of the new world foreshadows the resurrection of Christ. This sacrifice of Noah foreshadows the sacrifice of Christ. The idea that the Lord is satisfied and that on the basis of that offering, he will pledge never again. It's a bit like the sacrifice Christ made, which satisfied the justice and the wrath of God. Noah foreshadows Jesus in some way. A very popular image of the church, especially in medieval times, was the idea of the ark, the place into which you climb in order to ride out in safety the flood of judgment which would inevitably overwhelm the earth. And therefore, as the animals and the people left the ark, they're entering the new heaven and the new earth, the new world, which is described in Revelation. So somehow this story is bound up with the Gospels and with the Revelation, with the resurrection and sacrifice of Jesus, and with the new heavens and the new earth, and the promise to his people, and this covenant in Jesus' blood. Paul, in the city of Athens, describes, and it's a somewhat ambiguous description, he says, he noted the city was full of idols, and he said to the Athenians, I see you're very religious. Now that term could be a bit backhanded, it could mean, I see you're very superstitious, or I see you're very gullible, even, I see you're somewhat weak-spirited, or it's not necessarily a compliment, but it's not necessarily an insult either. It's an ambiguous phrase. And in the context of who he's talking to, because the, the passage describes before and after Stoic and Epicurean philosophers, they would interpret it differently on, depending on how they particularly viewed the gods. But all of them had an opinion about the gods about which Paul was talking. Paul, it says, was grieved because there were so many idols, so many statues, so many, if you like, pretenders to the claim of God in the city. And amid all this chaos, all this confusion of pretense and all these people and all this superstition and all this, what Paul would consider false observance, pointless observance, he finds this altar described to an unknown God. And here he says, this God whom you worship unknown, I will make known to you. He promises knowledge in the place of ignorance. He says, I will show you what you can worship truthfully, knowingly, as opposed to what you do not understand at the moment. And he says the way to do this is that he says, God has called all people everywhere to repent to believe in him and as a sign of the truth of these things of the claim that he calls all men everywhere to himself he has raised a man from the dead and this obviously provoked a certain amount of scoffing what on earth is this foreigner talking about they say what's this scribbler this babbler this this person on about some of them said oh we'll get back to you on this but paul's plea was everyone everywhere with the same conditions. Repent and turn to the one about how you have now heard of him. Your former ignorance will be laid aside because now you know. 
But now you know, it puts a moral obligation on the hearers. How will you respond? In the Gospel reading, Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. People often have opinions about this word love. Love, in our culture, often means either romantic passion and people speak of the helplessness they are in the throes of romantic passion. Or they speak about feelings as being somehow irresistible, as somehow defining their very nature. But this term of love tends to be focused heavily on feelings and inclinations, on passions and desires, and not so much on a sense of obligation or action. But the love Jesus is talking about nearly always involves a moral obligation. Somehow an instruction, somehow something which we have to do, irrespective of what we might feel. And therefore it cannot be just sentimentality, it cannot be just a rush of affection, it can't be just warm fuzzies, it has to be something more. Because he said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And the commandment that Paul has mentioned is, God calls all men everywhere to repent. We need to repent. We need to change. We need to admit to our ignorance. And we need to admit to our fault. And we need to turn to the one who can save us. And this is his pledge and his promise. Jesus said these things in the context of what we call the Last Supper. He was about to die, to leave his friends, his disciples, a group of people with whom he had become very close and intimate. He had lived with them for a couple of years at least. The, the ones who are mentioned here, often thought of as just the twelve, were just like the inner circle of this group. But there was a whole load of them. At Pentecost it was said there was 120 of them. So this is obviously part, just a section, of a much bigger group. Jesus in his travels is described as being supported by some wealthy women who would donate to them who would you know, provide for them out of their means. In other words, we only get a glimpse, just a flicker of the group of people, the kind of halo of people surrounding him. And these are the people who are about to be abandoned because he's about to die. But Jesus says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will not abandon you. The idea of being orphaned was often used in the context of a rabbi with his followers. And Jesus is saying, I'm not going to abandon you. Of course, it's often used in the context of someone who simply loses their parents. And he has promised the Father. So this meaning of the word orphan, which he is contradicting, is in both counts. He is not abandoning his friends. He is giving us a Father. We are not orphans. But the pledge of this, the reality of this, the experience of this, will be by the one he describes as the, the comforter, the advocate, the spirit of truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. This spirit is the truth. It communicates truth. It will mediate truth. It will reveal truth. It is part of the truth. And the way that this, this little conversation of Jesus goes around, when he talks about the Father in me and in, I am in the Father, he says, I am with you, the Spirit is with you, that you will know all these things. He is endlessly bouncing off the Father, the Son and the Spirit to make it clear that they are not separate, that they are not divided, that somehow one does not supersede the other or alienate the other, or that somehow we don't prefer one over the other that somehow, in some extraordinary way, Jesus, by this covenant, by the giving of his Spirit, unites us, his people, to all of them, to the Father, to the Son, and to the Spirit. And that the reality of this, the life of this, the knowledge and the experience of this, will come to us by this Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, who would inevitably reveal to us who he is and what he does and by whom we will know that he is with us, that Jesus will be revealed to us, that we will know the Father because Jesus has sent his Spirit to us, that this is the pledge he has given us. Thereby do we enter our rest. The name of Noah, rest. 
He is the one who grants us rest from the weariness and the toil and the futility of life. It is in his presence that we find our rest. It is his sacrifice that satisfies the justice of the Father and makes peace. He is the pleasing aroma, the sweet smell. He is the one who brings about all these things by his death and by his resurrection. And we can enter this covenant with him. We can become part of this. We can become associated with this. We can receive the benefits of this by repenting, as Paul said. The psalm says, Bless our God, O people. Let the sound of his praise be heard, who has kept our soul among the living and has not let our foot slip. This is a song of praise that can be shared by all peoples, called by Paul, the Athenians, by all the peoples that come out of the earth, the, the, sorry, the ark. Because symbolically, Noah filled the world with the peoples. And symbolically, Jesus brings the world into the new heaven and the new earth. He is the one, if you like, who built the true ark, the eternal ark, into which all of us can climb and be safe so we can ride out the storms of judgment and be delivered safely to the new heaven and the new earth. So, the psalmist says, Come and hear, all you who fear God, and I will tell what he has done for my soul. I will cry to him with my mouth and high praises on my tongue. If I cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. We have to abandon the iniquity. We cannot cherish it, because then the Lord will turn away. We must abandon everything which is not pleasing to him. We must repent. But truly God has listened, because as we do these things, he does listen. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, because he has not rejected my prayer or removed his steadfast love from me. His pledge is that he will never abandon us. He will never forsake us. He will never forego us. If we listen to his son, if we obey his commandments, he will love us and he will bring us safely home. He will grant us rest. Amen. And now we come to that point in the service where we affirm together our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now Jeremy will bring the special prayer for today, our collect for the sixth Sunday after Easter, and then Rana will bring our intercessions for this morning. Thank you. Almighty and everlasting God, who art always more ready to hear than we to pray, and art more want to give more than either we desire or deserve, pour down upon us the abundance of thy mercy, forgiving us those things whereof our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things which we are not worthy to ask, but through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Gracious God, you have made us, our world, and everything in it. And so we pray, with one voice, proclaiming your presence, to all the earth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. 
Holy God, we pray for your church throughout the world. Those who are serving in difficult situations and for all those who seek God at home, at work, in the streets, in their gardens, in their kitchens, wherever they get opportunity to worship Him. We pray for the stillness to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit and to recognize what our personal relationship with you has done for us. We pray for all who strive to proclaim the good news of the gospel, especially in these difficult times when we cannot meet together in our church buildings. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Creator God, we pray for all who wield power, that they may be guided by the spirit of truth. We especially pray all the world's governments as they continue to do their best during the COVID-19 pandemic. Merciful God, we pray, bring comfort to those grieving loved ones. Lord, we pray for all those people who are frontliners by putting their lives at risk, they are trying to save others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Father God, we pray for family and colleagues, friends and lovers, for neighbors and strangers, for all those who we are missing, with whom we normally would break bread at home, at work, in the community and in our church. But we continue to pray for all who grow, harvest and prepare the food we eat and for those who continue to deliver at shops and the supermarkets. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Merciful God, we pray for those kept fresh in our memory and for those long forgotten, for all who ever took the breath of life at home, at work, in the streets and in the pews. We pray for mercy and forgiveness for the dead and for those who mourn them. May they find rest in the spirit embrace and we continue them to your keeping forever. Lord, we pray for all those whose memories come to our mind during this time of the year. We bring before you Edwin, Alice, Edith Moore, Anne Cooksey, Hilda Moore, and Amelia Latch. Lord, we pray for all those who are weak in body, soul, and spirit. Lord, we bring them before you, the greatest healer, seeking your help and mercy for them. We pray for Brian Jones, Vara Lewis, Asmne, Sharon Williams, Marilyn Griffiths, Peter Morris, King, Gary, and all those for whom we regularly pray. 
Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. We pray for all those who mourn, those who have recently lost their dear ones. We pray for Barbara Williams, Margaret Hodge, John Walter, Rhiannon Blackburn. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. God of heaven and earth, companion in life, spirit of truth, to you alone we turn our eyes and lift our hearts. Help us to keep your commandments and to love one another as you love us. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. We now bring our prayers to a conclusion by saying the words that Jesus himself taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We now sing together our final hymn. <laughs>
Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all forevermore. Amen. Amen.